Good morning. This bright, sunshiny day, March the 31st. Uh, we're in Oklahoma, so we're in, eternally grateful um, that the uh, damage from the tornadoes was not what it could have been. Um, we're grateful that there's not been any fatalities. But we're also praying for the seven that's in the hospital and especially one that's critical. We're praying for the first responders that are out there uh, digging through and responding to these kind of catastrophes that does happen. We thank you that we have a father that is always present with us even in our times of trouble. And we've already had praise reports and I know there'll be more praise reports um, coming from this uh, tragedy that took place in Oklahoma. But uh, we just thank you, God, that, that it's you that we have our faith in. So we're starting on March 31st in our one-year Bible study. <clears throat> Got a full full house today. <clears throat> Got some, uh, everybody's extra special that stops in for our Bible study. And I'm especially pleased to have Travis this morning with us in person. It's nice to hear his voice and to hear his laugh when we're on the video, but I love having him in person, so. Um, he's extra special. Each one of you that joins us through video, and those of you that are viewing the videos, <clears throat> never ceases to amaze me when I see those numbers of the people that's viewing them. So, uh, to God be the glory. We're still in Deuteronomy. <clears throat> um, still Moses and the Israelites. Um, more of the same. Um, the story continues. The historical events continue to be documented. Uh, we're Deuteronomy 16 through seven, uh, chapter 17, verse 20. So in verse uh, 16, uh, chapter 16, I'm sorry, verse 15 um, is, a, is another promise that, again, he's given them, Moses has given them instructions from God. He's telling them, uh, day by day, minute by minute, what they're supposed to be doing. And then the promise is God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. And I love that promise. And it's a promise that we stand up. We are God's chosen people. Yes, indeed, this is a story that really took place. It's Moses hearing from God speaking directly to the Israelites, but it is God speaking directly to each one of us. He wants us to hear his voice, he wants us to seek him in all things, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And that as we are in fellowship with God, as we allow him to be our father, as we submit ourselves to be his child and to come to him in, as a child comes to a father for direction and for guidance, <clears throat> When we obey, when we get that guidance, then the promise is, is that God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands. Now think about that. That means everything you touch your hand to is going to be blessed. Everything. It, it, it says all. What does all leave out? All doesn't leave out anything. Everything we touch is blessed. But here's the deal. Why are we not living that? Do you wake up every morning with the thought that, oh, everything I touch today is going to be blessed? I, I venture to guess probably not. And why not? It's, it's real simple. It's a, it's a one little tiny word, and it's unbelief. You read these words, and you don't believe what he tells us. Everything we touch is blessed, <laughs> unless you're not obeying God. If you're not obeying God, then chances are what you're touching isn't necessarily being blessed. But if you're obeying him and your heart is pure towards him in every aspect, it doesn't mean we're perfect. Praise God he doesn't call us to perfection. Our spirit man is perfect. Our spirit man is imputed with the righteousness of God and we're one with him. There is no flaw in our spirit man. Now our mind, our will, and our emotions have to get in alignment, and this body has to get in alignment. But it starts with faith. It's faith. It, it's, it, we have to believe what this word says. And if I wake up in the morning and I tell myself, oh, everything I touch today will be blessed, or I wake up today saying, what is going to happen today, then guess what? I, I mean, you, you just set the tone for your entire day. For me, I choose to wake up every day and say, I'm blessed abundantly. If y'all have ever asked me how I am, I'm going to tell you, I'm blessed abundantly, don't I, Travis? I'm blessed abundantly. And I believe that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being flipped with that. I, I, I say that because I have a hard time believing it, and, I, and I'm going to speak it until I get it. 
I'm going to speak it because I speak it because this is what this book tells me. How many times in the last two weeks have we read the blessings that are ours from God? He tells us we're blessed coming in, we're blessed going out, we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. Everything we touch will be blessed. I'm blessed abundantly. And that's how I choose to start my day. Um, it goes on, and I, I just had a thought. I don't want to dwell here very long, but in, in chapter 17, verse uh, 5, it's talking about sin. And again, oh my goodness. I, I, okay, I had two thoughts. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> two thoughts. My first thought was, what if, what if, I mean, I'm blessed abundantly. Everything I touch is blessed. What if there was an awakening in our government system and the powers to be decided to go back through the Old Testament readings and refresh our judicial system. Oh, my word. I mean, what if, and maybe we ought to be praying for this, that we pray that those government officials will simply read these words every year. Maybe they'll do the one-year Bible and see where the government that they're running came from in America because it's all over it, you guys. I mean, we read it and we read it and we go, oh, that's where that law came from. Oh, that's why we do that. That's why, uh, that's where that statue came from. It's all based on this book. Okay, so that was one thought. Second thought is, now the written law back then, in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, before they had the spirit of the living God living on the inside of them, in verse 5 in chapter 17, then you shall bring out your gates, that man or woman who has done this evil thing, and they were just talking about sin, and you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones. Well, not talking about judicial government now. I'm talking spiritual truce. In spiritual truce, we don't have the written law because it's been fulfilled. We no longer have to stone each other, picking up physical stones and stoning each other, but what happens to us spiritually when we decide not to obey God? What happens to me spiritually when I grumble and complain? It's just as though I'm stoning myself. That's the thought I had this morning. It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual stoning because the truth is, is our spirit is perfect. The truth is, is that we're his. What's the worst thing that can happen? I love what my pastor says. It's a great day to live and it's a great day to die. To be absent from the body, the word says, is to be present with Christ. So why do we worry? Why do we grumble? Why do we complain? I mean, seriously, you want to know what your spirit man looks like? You want to know what's inside of you? Just do an inventory on a daily basis of the words that's coming out of your mouth. Do I speak more faith or do I speak more unbelief? Do I speak more peace or do I speak more worry? What comes out of our mouth and then you'll see the picture of what's inside of you and then we'll know why we're sick all the time. We'll know why our body starts falling apart. Worry and anxiety and stress will kill you. It will kill your physical body and it's, it's anti-spirit. It's, it's anti-spirit. Jesus Christ died so that we can have the Sabbath rest all the time. Perfect peace all the time in the midst of the storm. We just read just this week about Jesus getting on the boat, going downstairs underneath, going to sleep, and then a storm came up, and the disciples came and said, don't you understand we're perishing? We talked about that. Don't you understand we're dying? The storm was so great. And Jesus was in perfect peace. He was in such peace he could sleep while the waves were crashing around him. I'm telling you, that's what I'm working towards. The whole world can be falling down around me. The economy has gone to, to the dogs. Um, our government is, is evil and corrupt. Our, my family has gone by the wayside. My children have turned against me. My neighbors talk about me. My church don't speak to me when I come in the door. I mean, you just name it. All the things we get offended by, all the things we worry about. You know, my bank account is close to zero. What All the things that causes us stress and anxiety and worry is happening around us, and I'm working towards that peace. That, that I rise above the circumstances below, as my pastor says, and down here is all this chaos, and I rise above it in my spirit, man, and I just float on the clouds in perfect peace. And I believe that's what Jesus Christ died for. 
I believe that's why he told us that we're to have a full life, to the full and overflowing. He didn't just say an okay life. He didn't just, just say, well, we'll have a life where we just get by. You know, uh, ask somebody how they're doing and say, well, I'm, I'm there. I'm here. Really? Oh, bless your heart. I mean, that's not what Christ died to give us was just, a, oh, I'm here. I'm here. It's okay. I have a wonderful life. I have a blessed life. I'm blessed abundantly. You're blessed abundantly. Whether you believe it or not, you're blessed abundantly. I mean, we are the most spoiled um, nation in the world. While we're the most blessed nation, the luxuries we have in America doesn't even come, I mean, compare to the poverty that's in other places. And yet, if our pillow's just not right, we grumble and complain. Or if you know, my car gets more than four years old. I'm grumbling, complaining. I, oh, oh, okay. Oh, said I wasn't going to dwell there. <laughs> um, oh, okay, and then um, let's go on down to uh, chapter 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you. you now remember this week we talked about the land represents any prayer request that you may have. Uh, so what prayer requests do you have? What have you been praying for? What, are you, what would you like to see come to fruition in your life? That's the land God has promised you. Um, again, as long as our desires uh, line up with his desires, I don't believe I can pray for a billion dollars just at the top of my head without some kind of divine guidance in that and think that that's just going to happen. But when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it, there's a promise in that, and you possess it, um, it, and dwell in it, and then say, uh, talking about a king, then let's, let's uh, fast forward on down into verse 16, uh, and, it's, and it's talking, it's, he's, okay, now let's talk in the physical. Verse 16, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to, we're talking about a king. So he's, he's, he's prophesying, to them telling them that one of these days they're going to ask for a king, which we all know they do. Against God's wishes, they ask for a king. So Moses is warning them what's going to happen when they get a king, and he's telling the king that he must not acquire many horses just for himself. He didn't want a greedy king. But he's also telling them, telling them not to have a king that would tempt them to go back to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord uh, has said to you. So he's talking about how he'll justify it. Oh, let's go back into Egypt because look at all of the wealth we can accumulate so we'll get more horses. Or let's just go back to Egypt because they've got lots of horses and we're going to... So the, the excuse, the justification we use to go back in this particular case would be to acquire wealth or whatever, but he's warning them not to go back, not to go back. God's delivered you from a job you're not supposed to be at and then you're unemployed and you don't know what to do and you're following in your unbelief, don't go back. Um, don't go back to the old mindsets. The old, old Elizabeth who used to worry and complain and, and be stressed all the time, don't go back to that. He's telling us the temptation is, is to go back to where we were before, back to the old strongholds. Here's the deal, guys. We develop a life that is comfortable in our misery. I mean, I know that sounds strange, but that is the absolute truth. We get so comfortable in our chaos that we don't realize that if we start having peace, we'll, we'll start the chaos ourselves. I mean, think about it. That's exactly what will happen. Uh, we can't stand the silence. We can't stand the peace when all you've ever had is chaos. And, and we go back to the land in which we were in bondage and in slavery and we stir that back up again. And he's cautioning us not to do that. Put the past behind us. The past doesn't determine our future. Yesterday, I'm telling you yesterday. There's those of you that's argued with your spouses yesterday. There's those of you that woke up and, and snapped your kids' uh, heads off yesterday. There's those of you that was offended yesterday. There are those of you who yesterday looked bleak and dark and and, and this is a new day. We started this whole thing off that way, didn't we? This is a new day. Every day we start with a new, clean, fresh slate. And he's telling us, in today's reading, don't go back there. Don't go back. Praise God we're not going back. That's um, Deuteronomy. And we're Luke uh, chapter 9, verses 7 through 27. 
see. Um, th okay, this is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Um, love, love, love this because, again, a, an awful lot of our worry, a lot, awful lot of our stress has to do with economy these days, has to do with the laws of the land, has to do with the jobs we have, has to do with the environment in our home, has to do with whether or not we're going to have enough money to make ends meet, what are we going to do? you know, when the economy fails, on and on and on. And here they are out in the, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, and there's not the, any convenience stores or restaurants around, and the people get hungry, and I love it because the disciples said, um, well, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And the disciple says, well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we're to go and buy food for all the people. I mean, we, he's telling them there's no restaurants around. We, we can't go down to the local bakery and buy bread. I just love that. <laughs> so um, then it goes on in verse 14 and says, for there were about 5,000 men. So if there were 5,000 men, I said it myself. I said, this is where Jesus fed the 5,000, fed a lot more than 5,000. They just count the men. Uh, way more than 5,000. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, for he knows where his help comes from. He looked to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he, Jesus, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. I love that word. Uh, Paul tells us to be content in whatever our circumstances. Right here, Jesus said they were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. They started with 12 loaves and two fish, and they picked up leftovers of 12 baskets. I'm telling y'all, you live in the land of plenty. If indeed you belong to God, you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear tomorrow. You don't have to worry about where your food's coming from. You don't have to worry who's going to pay the electricity. Because if you'll trust God, we live in the land of more than enough. More than enough. He takes care of the sparrow. How much more will he take care of you? Verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. Just like I talked about getting comfortable in our chaos, that we don't know how to have peace. I, I, I mean, do another inventory. In your relationships, how many times is there conflict? And if that number is high, guess what the common denominator is? It's you. We have a tendency to want to blame all of our conflict on somebody else. We need to be doing what? Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24 says, and that is, search my heart, O Lord. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me on the path of righteousness. And then here's our instructions. This is the instructions to live by. If anyone would come after me, Jesus, let him deny himself. What does deny himself mean? Deny myself the right to be right. Deny myself the right to win an argument. Deny myself the right to change my spouse. Den deny myself the right to dictate to my neighbor, to dictate to anybody in my life. Live and let live. Deny myself is to let just live and let live. I, I don't have to control what Tom does. I don't have to control what the people in my life are doing. Deny myself. It's not about me. It's not about me. One of my favorite phrases, we're all selfish in this flesh. We're all out for the fittest is the, is the one who survives. We're all out, and, and, it, and it's just the opposite. If we truly, truly, truly want to come after him, we deny ourselves, and we take up our cross daily. What cross is God asking you to bear? Is it a an unruly child? Is it a grandchild that you're having to pray for right now? What cross are you having to bear? Is it uh, not satisfaction in the job you have? Is it, well, I mean, what is it? Uh, you name it. What cross is God asking you to bear? 
and follow me. So lift up, I have that, I have that vision right now, that vision of, of Jesus walking up that hill and he's got that cross and it falls. We've all seen the pictures. Hollywood does that for us. So he's, he's been beaten beyond recognition. He, he's lost more blood than what we can fathom. They're spitting at him. They're jeering at him. They're treating him worse than any one of us has ever been treated. And the cross falls off of his shoulder, probably dislocated his shoulder. And he looked down at it. And in that moment, I know these words came to his mind. Let him deny himself. Jesus denied himself in that moment. Um, beyond my pain is God's glory. Take up this cross. And he took it up and he picked it up and he continued on. And that's what he's asking us to do. Is your burdens that heavy on you? I mean, you just think about that trek up that hill when you're feeling sorry for yourself. I don't have it so bad. Take up your cross and follow me. We can bear it. We can bear it because no weapon formed against us will prosper. We can bear it because it's the spirit of the living God that lives on the inside of us, just like that same spirit that, that got Jesus up that hill and on that cross that day. We can bear it. We can bear it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I'll end with the Proverbs. The Psalms is good, and I know I've been uh, skipping over them, but I've been a little windy the last few days. So Proverbs 12, 8, and 9. A man is commended according to his good sense, but one, but one of twisted mind is despised. Better to be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. I love you all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday for our one-year Bible study. And I love each one of you. You're my favorite. Thanks for talking with us.